is primordial. It's always been there, or at least always been there since shortly after the Big Bang. And our understanding of it is indeed that a little bit of lithium was made in the first few minutes of the universe when there was what we call Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Most of, most of the helium in the universe was built in those first few minutes, and also a small amount of lithium was built. And that small amount of primordial lithium, lithium left over from the Big Bang, is present in all stars no matter how old they are, because it's always been there to use to partly make stars out there, essentially. So that's the lithium so it's not totally different from the age metallicity relation. It's just that it's the lithium, beryllium, and boron are built in a different way than those other elements are. Is there a reason to, what's the reason that beryllium abundance is lower than boron abundance? Um, I believe that it is nothing other than those those collisions make boron more easily than they make beryllium. It's just as simple as that. Yeah. A greater fraction of the time a boron is created by one of those collisions than a beryllium. Source, you're just in this rocket ship that is accelerating upwards. Yeah. Okay. Right. So let's kind of compare and contrast. So in chapter six, we argued that a photon will be bent by gravity. It's well, the photon's path is bent by gravity, and we argued that from the perspective of instead of an accelerating rocket ship deep in space. Uh, a compartment that's just dropping near Earth or some other planet. And so the argument there was, okay, if the compartment was deep in space, floating, no gravity, just floating in space, laser beams would travel straight. So that's this situation right here. And then we said, okay, principle of equivalence says, if you just drop that compartment in Earth's vicinity, it acts as though there's no gravity in it. That eliminates the effects of gravity in it. So the principle of equivalence predicts that a photon will travel in a freely falling elevator exactly the same way that it will travel in an elevator that was drifting between the stars. So we said that means that relative to the falling elevator, the dashed red line is the straight path that somebody inside the falling elevator would see it travel. It would hit the far wall exactly the same height above the floor that it left the near wall. But then if that's true, that means that as seen from the outside, notice that the photon is following this white curved path, that the photon is falling in the gravitational field. And that means that gravity deflects the paths of photons. So that's the argument we made in class. And the homework, the challenge was, okay, let's use the other version of the principle of equivalence, which says that if I have an accelerating rocket deep in space, that will reproduce the effects of gravity. That in a sense, that really, we would say there is a uniform gravitational field inside of it. So how can we make that argument? Well, okay, I'll draw our rocket here with my amazing drawing capabilities. 
there's the flame coming out of the bottom of the rocket. So the rocket is accelerating upwards. It's got some acceleration upwards. And we can even make it 9.8 meters per second squared. <coughs> if we're trying to make it feel like Earth inside the rocket. So I fire a laser beam horizontal to the floor. I aim it horizontal to the floor. If the rocket engines weren't firing, we're back in this situation. No gravity, no acceleration. The laser beam just travels straight across the rocket, right? Now, consider what happens in the rocket that's accelerating. The laser beam doesn't care whether it's surrounded by an accelerating rocket or not. So as seen from outside the rocket, if this rocket were transparent and we're just watching from the outside, we're drifting and watching the rocket accelerate past us. What we will see on the outside is that the photon just moves in a straight line. Does that make sense? Okay, that's what we would see. But at the same time that the photon is moving in that straight line, what is the rocket doing? The rocket is picking up speed, flying faster and faster upwards. So that means here's the photon, the laser beam initially starting horizontal across the rocket, and it continues to travel horizontally. So as seen from the outside, it's still just traveling that horizontal line, but the rocket is moving up faster and faster. So that means that by the time it gets to the far wall, the rocket has moved up here somewhere. So when the photon hits the far wall, it's not gonna hit this point right here, straight across from where the laser was fired from. It's gonna hit somewhere down here because somewhere down here has moved up to where that point is. So what that means is that we will see the laser follow a curved trajectory because of the fact that the rocket is going faster and faster upwards as the photon is traveling across it. In other words, relative to the inside of the rocket, this is how we'll see the photon move. Now, the photon is moving so fast that this is greatly exaggerating what it would look like, but in other words, the path of the photon has to curve because the rocket itself is accelerating and so even though it's seen from the outside, the photon just moves in a straight line, relative to the rocket, the photon appears to be getting closer to the floor. The same argument would hold for an eraser that I threw across the rocket. If I just threw a race, an eraser across the rocket, it would fly straight as seen by somebody floating on the outside, but they would also see the rocket accelerating upwards, <coughs> which would mean that relative to somebody in the rocket, the eraser is getting closer and closer to the floor as it moves across the rocket. So here, we're making the argument that because of the acceleration of the rocket, relative to the rocket itself, the photon follows a curved path. But wait a minute, the equivalence principle says that acceleration of the rocket frame of reference is equivalent to a gravitational field. So if the photon is gonna follow a curved path inside the rocket, it's also gonna follow a curved path in a gravitational field. So that's, that's the argument that I was looking to be made with that one. Are you okay with that? That's kind of, um, it's difficult for me to explain in my words. Mm -hmm. Maybe it, um, expect that to be an open-ended question. Uh, yeah, I would want you to explain it in your own words as best you can. I recommend, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. Okay. And so, draw a picture like that and explain what's happening in the picture and decorate it with the best words you can think of. You know, imagine you're trying to explain it to your roommate, right? Yeah. Just, just do your best with that. Try to get your roommate to understand it. I don't need you to explain it like it's to a scientist. Just if you could make your roommate understand it, that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> acceleration of the floor as seen from the outside lets us know that that straight traveling photon gets closer and closer to the floor because the floor is rising up to meet it. That means if you're inside the rocket, what you'll see is 
the photon is falling towards the floor. As from the outside, it looks like the floor is rising up towards the photon. From the inside, that'll look like the photon is falling down towards the floor. That's what it really comes down to. <clears throat> Yeah, so there's three possible shapes of the universe if it is homogeneous and isotropic, if it's the same in every direction and the same at every point, which is only approximately true. But if you can make those assumptions, then it works out that there's a certain average density of the universe called the critical density which works out to be equivalent to about five hydrogen atoms per cubic meter of space. So it's a very low number, it doesn't take a lot. <clears throat> if, if the universe's average density is equal to that so-called critical density, this, the geometry of the universe is flat, no curvature of space-time on large scales. The overall curvature is flat. If the density is larger than that critical density, then this, the geometry of the universe is spherical. Now, it's something we can't picture. In other words, when I say sphere, you normally think of a three-dimensional spherical surface, I'm sorry, a two-dimensional spherical surface um, that encloses a three-dimensional volume. The spherical universe is something our minds can't picture. It would be a three-dimensional surface that was spherical in shape in a way that I can't picture that encloses, if you will, there's not an FB in the inside of it, but if there was, it would be enclosing a four-dimensional volume. Okay, I can't picture it. But geometrically speaking, you can write down the math and it all makes sense. The universe would be spherical in shape and the analogy, the two-dimensional analogy is the surface of the sphere, even though it's really a three-dimensional thing that's carved like a sphere that I can't possibly picture because I can't picture if the density is less than the critical density, the universe is shaped like a saddle instead of a sphere. So it would be um, one way is curved this way, the other direction is curved this way. There's like two perpendicular directions of curvature at every point, and they're curved in opposite directions. For the two-dimensional analogy, for the three-dimensional universe, <laughs> two of them are curved one way, and one of them is curved the other way through the fourth dimension, so to speak. So again, I can't picture it, but that's what the math is saying, essentially. So to summarize, if the universe is equal to the critical density, it's flat. If it's more dense than that, it's spherical. If it's less dense than that, it's saddle shaped. The spherical universe is finite in volume. There's only so much space in the universe. A flat universe and a saddle shaped universe are both infinite. They have an infinite amount of volume. Yeah, we think that on large, so the universe appears to be flat, as a matter of fact, yes. Which probably doesn't mean that it's literally flat, because it's not homogeneous and isotropic. What it probably really means is that our local part of the universe appears to be flat because the universe is so large compared to the part of it that we can see that it gives us the illusion of being flat, just like being on the surface of the spherical Earth, it looks flat to us simply because Earth is so much larger than the part of it that we can see. <clears throat> and that's probably the case for the universe, too. It probably has some complicated, weird, crazy shape, but it's so much larger than the part of it that we can see that the part of it that we can see looks flat. It's just an illusion, so to speak. Which is pretty crazy to think about. Earthers are just silly people who think, no, the Earth really is flat. No. Uh, so so uh, the cosmological kind of analogy would be, we don't have really flat universes. The universe looks flat, but we think it just looks flat. It's just too, it's too big for us to explore enough of it to see that it's actually got a bunch of crazy shit. Okay, so
Gravitational lensing refers to this, the gravity bends the paths of photons. And so <clears throat> what that means is that if you have an object which has enough mass, strong enough gravity, it could very noticeably bend the paths of photons. And that's why black holes, where you see like, you know, these images of them, um, not literally that somebody took with a camera, but you know, artists reproductions of what they look like, you see all these crazy effects where things behind them are crazy, distorted, and stuff like that. That's due to gravitational lensing. Clusters of galaxies, individual galaxies, the sun, they all do gravitationally lens things. It's just that black holes are aware it's a really extreme example. But we did show some examples of galaxies and clusters of galaxies gravitationally lensing <coughs> the light of galaxies that were behind them, for example. I don't remember what chapter we put that in, but... Um, oh, oh, the dark yeah, that was chapter. like when uh, <clears throat> like a supernova happened and we see... Right. Yeah, yeah. So this is, this is one where I uh, showed an example of gravitational lensing in action, where these are all actually... These blue things are actually all the same galaxy, but seen multiple times because the light from it took multiple paths to Earth when it passed through the gravitational curve space-time of the galaxy, the cluster that's in between us and that galaxy. So without gravitational lensing, we'd see one nice, well-defined image of that galaxy. With gravitational lensing, crazy, we see multiple images of the same galaxy. And if a supernova pops off on it, we'd see it go up multiple times because the light in the different images is a few weeks apart. So it's distance is a few light weeks different for different paths of that galaxy, which is very far away, uh, but light weeks is enough for it to notice that over it's a significant time delay. example of gravitational lensing discovered where we saw four images of the same quasar. Um, and at the time that was really revolutionary and now we just have multiple examples of it in various parts of the sky. Um, so you said a, a parsec is the distance away something needs to be parallaxed to be one. That's right, that's what parsec means. It means parallax parsec. Yeah. So if something is one parsec away, that means that its parallax is one arcsec. And that works out to be about 3.26 light years. So, yeah. so from that standpoint, it's just a conversion factor. But we often use parsecs because that's what's tied directly to the way that we measure the distances. So these days, it used to be astronomers who usually use light years, but these days we usually get distances in parsecs because of what's directly tied to our distance measure. Yeah, a little, but that's not really the reason to do it. It really is just that it's based on yeah. parallax. And then, you know, if, if we lived on Mars, if we, it's, it's kind of, it's probably temporary. You know, if we ever go to the stars, um, that'll be obsolete because that's just for our Earth going around our sun. Yeah. If you were on another planet around another star, your parsec would be a different length because your baseline would be a different length. Whereas light years are light years no matter where you live. So from that standpoint, maybe we're making the wrong choice, but whatever. We need to stop them. I'm gonna call the IAU right now and say, you're not thinking of the future. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, what, what, what is? Is it Venus law? Well? 
Beam's law. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. So that's um, remember that's that's a physics 280 thing. Um, yeah, it's been a while. It has been a while. Okay. So Beam's law is the one that says that the peak wavelength from a black body is related to its temperature. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's the one that explains why when I make a hot when I when I make a light bulb filament hotter and hotter, the light gets bluer and bluer. Basically, yeah, okay. it starts out like a reddish glow, and it becomes yellow, and then white. And if you could make it hot enough, it would turn bluish white. Except that any filament we can create will vaporize before it gets to those kinds of temperatures. Well, it will snap before it gets to those kinds of temperatures. So yeah, mean law is, is the one that describes that uh, fact. And remember, we gave a formula for it that. Um, wavelength is the wavelength at which the curve is a maximum and the formula said that and the max is 2.9 times 10 to the 6th power nanometer Kelvin divided by the temperature of course you can transpose that temperature is that same number, 2.9 times 10 to the 6th nanometer Kelvin divided by the peak, uh, the peak wavelength. Sometimes you say lambda peak, sometimes you say lambda max. I don't remember what your book says, so I'm just going to say lambda max, but it means the same thing. So if you're told the temperature, you just divide, and that tells you the peak wavelength in nanometers, and if you were told the peak wavelength, Dividing would tell you the temperature in Kelvin that would produce that. Is the peak wavelength. He just goes nuts. Yeah, that would be ET. There's so much hidden. No, it's, it's uh, statistical mechanics, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We're talking about the consequences of dividing temperature as a partial of that increase, right? So yep. Uh -huh. Right. The discontinuous jumps from an infinite temperature yeah. to a negative infinite. Right, yeah. In a formal sense. Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh -huh. So, yeah. So, yeah. Those are, that's pretty crazy stuff. Yeah. 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 But that's not what we're talking about. Yeah, maybe. yeah, that won't be on the test. <laughs> yeah. And then just like the, the structure of the test and mm -hmm. the test in the past and multiple choice and the short answer. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to predict that there will be 38 multiple choice questions and four uh, short answer slash SNC questions. If I had to guess, that's what the fact is. And I would also guess that each of the short answer essay questions would be worth four points. So there will be 38 points of multiple choice and 16 points of essay. Yeah, I, I, don't, I just got a feeling of that. Yeah. If I had to guess, that's yeah. what I would want to do. Thank you for doing this. You're very welcome. Thank you. Yep. All right. And then the other people are just going to have to open they bothered to watch that you asked their questions for them. I think you did good. I covered a lot, so yeah.